President of the American Enterprise Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this very important event on the future of protectionism and U.S. trade policy. Um, as many of you know, the future of U.S. trade has become one of the centerpieces of the 2016 election. Uh, one of the great ironies today is that it seems like at the national uh, candidate level, the only thing that brings Republicans and Democrats together on is uh, being against free trade, um, which is a strange state of affairs, I have to say. But that is not universally true among Republicans and Democrats. Uh, there are some who remember that free trade is one of the pillars of the free enterprise system that has indeed pulled two billion people out of poverty, out of starvation level poverty, since the 1970s, since many of us in this room were children. It's important to fight for it. It's what our scholars fight for, and it's what we're going to be hearing about today. To discuss the current political dynamic and the future of free trade, we have two of the country's most prominent advocates for free trade, Arizona Senator Jeff Flake and U.S. Trade Representative Michael Froman. Senator Flake has been a consistent and articulate, a tireless leader uh, on free trade over his career in the U.S. Senate and, and in the House of Representatives. And Ambassador Froman, as all of you know, is President Obama's principal advisor, negotiator, and spoke, spokesperson on international trade which includes the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, in, in the Asia-Pacific and the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership with the European Union. Um, our own scholar from here at AEI, Derek Scissors, will moderate a conversation between the Senator and the Ambassador, and then we're going to open it up to questions from you. So with that, please join me in welcoming the Ambassador and the Senator. Thank you both for being here. I want to get right to this. I think we have a lot to talk about, uh, and I want to encourage both of you to respond to each other and cut me entirely out of the conversation. That would be great. Um, let's start with where we are. The administration has, has a very ambitious trade agenda, a lot of acronyms, TPP, TTIP, TISA, uh, Bilateral Investment Treaty with China. What progress do you think we can be made before the new administration and the new Congress come in, and then following that, what should the priority, uh, and obviously you know, nobody, nothing we say here binds the next government, but what should the priority be early in 2017? Senator, if I could start with you. Well, if you, you read the popular press out there this morning, there's a front page article in Politico uh, talking about uh, Republican shift away from free trade. We've been seeing it, obviously. Uh, but it, it is disconcerting, and we've never been in a position like this where not just the the top two candidates, the top four candidates in this uh, year's presidential election uh, were all going against TPP, at least. Uh, uh, and it, so we're, we're in a difficult situation. I hope that when we get to the lame duck session, lame duck session is when you usually do things that you know you need to do, but you just can't bring yourself to do in, in, in a, at a regular time, a regular, uh, you know, with regular order. So I, I would hope that that members can still find a way with the tweak here or there to say, oh, now I can support this, in particular the TPP. Uh, we represent uh, in this country 3% of the world's population, 20% uh, of the world's economic output. Uh, we cannot grow economically uh, if we shut ourselves off. I mean, that's the bottom line. I think if you step back, most of uh, my colleagues understand that, even those who are going against, and, but be that as it may, statements have been made and uh, there are going to have to be some way for people to get back on board. And with TPP, if this pivot to Asia means anything, it has to start with, with TPP. And so I'm, I'm hopeful that in the lame duck uh, we can move ahead. If, if not then, uh, then uh, you know, we don't know exactly what the scenario will be in January. I think most of us have a pretty good idea, and uh, and I hope we can move forward uh, on that basis. Ambassador, I, I'm sure you agree with some of that, but any, what would you like to add? I agree with all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in violent agreement with the senator. Uh, first, let me say thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Thanks for, for having me and uh, for putting on this event. And I would say, notwithstanding a lot of the, the headlines, there is more bipartisanship out there on trade in a positive way than might meet the eye. And a lot of the recent polls people have seen yeah, from the Chicago uh, Council, among others, have shown that a majority of Democrats, a majority of Republicans, and a majority of independents actually support trade, support trade agreements. And that the support for TPP is in fact stronger than a lot of the, uh, uh, the, the 
of the popular notions out there. Uh, I had the pleasure this week, I was down in uh, Houston on Monday uh, and did an event with uh, former Secretary Baker uh, on TPP and then went up to Dallas and met with former President Bush and did an event at the Bush Institute. You know, there's still a lot of bipartisanship around this in a positive way and as the Senator said, we hope to build on that so that uh, we can get TPP through Congress as soon as possible. We've had a pretty good run over the course of the last uh, seven years, uh, finishing uh, Korea, Colombia, and Panama, finishing a trade facilitation agreement at the WTO, an agreement on agriculture subsidies, an agreement on the expansion of the information technology agreement, which just went into effect. And we're continuing to work on getting TPP through, uh, finishing uh, the transatlantic trade and investment partnership, the trade and services agreement, and the environmental goods agreement. We the people reject the TPP. The TPP stands for corporate protection and and the TPP is not fair trade. So there's a good, robust debate on TPP. <laughs> and, you know, I think the important thing is that <clears throat> uh, when people really look into the details, whether whether you care about raising labor and environmental standards around the world or ensuring that intellectual property rights are protected in a balanced and strong way uh, or taking on uh, government-owned corporations and making sure that they operate on a commercial basis when they compete against private firms. Uh, you know, it's 18,000 tax cuts uh, on our exports that are eliminated. It's the elimination, first time in any freight trade agreement to eliminate a subsidy, first time in a trade agreement in almost 20 years, eliminating uh, subsidies on fishery subsidies. Uh, fishery, uh, fishing, and so uh, you know, it's a very strong agreement really across the board, and uh, I'm, I'm, I continue to have faith both on the economic side and for because of its strategic value, as the Senator referred to, uh, to that uh, when the time comes, there'll be the necessary support in Congress to get it done. That's a good transition to my next question, which is for Senator Flake, uh, and you've already referred to it, sir. Uh, there's been a substantial rise, particularly in Republican unhappiness with free trade. Um, the stereotype used to be Republicans were in favor of free trade, Democrats were against it. Not really clear that was true. Uh, it certainly doesn't seem to be true at the national level now. What do you hear most from people? You've been going around uh, both uh, in Arizona and in Washington and probably elsewhere in the country defending free trade, defending the traditional Republican support for open markets. What do you hear from people? And, and you know, why, why did you decide it was important to take this up? Well, coming from Arizona, we're a border state, and it's frankly easier for me to promote uh, uh, free trade because Arizonans understand it, I think, perhaps uh, uh, more closely, uh, despite the rhetoric and things coming from the uh, certain presidential candidate about ripping up NAFTA, <laughs> and then it became from ripping up to renegotiating. Uh, but I think most Arizonans, at least, understand that uh, NAFTA's been a huge benefit I mean, when you look at NAFTA in 2011 for the first time, trilateral trade, uh, New Me uh, Mexico, Canada, and the U.S. Um, got to a billion dollars, I'm sorry, a trillion dollars. Uh, Arizona cross-border trade with Mexico is huge. Uh, pork exports, beef exports have uh, climbed dramatically. And, uh, and what uh, is underappreciated but, uh, but perhaps better understood by a lot of uh, companies in Arizona, it's not just cheaper goods uh, coming across, consumer goods, that's, that's a good thing, but increasingly Mexico, for example, is part of our supply chain. And a lot of the imports that we get in Arizona are simply inputs into our own exports or into goods that we consume. And, and that's, that is perhaps a little better understood there, so it's not as, as uh, politically uh, tough for me to push for free, free, free trade, but I can tell you around the country, uh, NAFTA has become a four-letter word. Um, but when you step back and say, where were we in 1994 before we had NAFTA? Mm -hmm. Where are we now in terms of uh, uh, both, you know, trilateral trade with Canada and uh, and Mexico, and how are these countries in a better position uh, to to uh, be able to consume our goods and purchase our goods? And as well as the spillover effects uh, with, with Mexico. Mexico's economy is much better off. Uh, net migration is south, not north, from Mexico now. And so uh, it's, it's easier in Arizona, and we see that firsthand. In Arizona, then, as, as a state that, just a little follow-up, that, that should be more uh, trade-oriented, say, 
what, where, what are the challenges you hear in Arizona, even among people who say, look, we, we support open trade. We don't, we don't want to turn back the clock 25 years. But nonetheless, that doesn't mean trade is perfect and it has a, you know, a wonderful impact in every American community. What do, you, what do you hear about what they say are still challenges, despite the, the strong benefits for Arizona? Well, you, you still hear some of the same things that, it's, you know, that people parrot from what they hear on some of the cable shows. Uh, um, so, so that comes out, but, but those whose jobs, and in Arizona I think it's about 110,000 jobs directly related to trade with Mexico, um, they understand that, uh, that, that trade works for them and that although it would be nice to simply enter into bilateral trade agreements, that's not the world today. And uh, our trade partners have choices in particular with TPP, if not them, Southeast Asian countries are going to trade with somebody else. They will enter into trade agreements. It just won't be with us. <laughs> and so I think if we can spread that message, and gratefully, uh, AEI and uh, so many groups, uh, the letter that went out the other day headed by the National Taxpayers Union and others, uh, just uh, very helpful that the outside world has, has at least stood up and said, you know, despite the political environment, and let's face it, it's far easier for a political candidate to point to a plant that's been closed and then blame trade, whether trade had anything to do with it or just modernization or, or automation or anything else. It's easier to do that than to quantify in 30 seconds the benefits of free trade. So that's why it's so difficult in a political environment. But when the rubber hits the road and we were, we were called on to pass TPA, to be able to come up with uh, these trade agreements, uh, we were able to do so. And that's what gives me hope that in the end, uh, as we get past this political silly season, then we get back to, know, to doing what we should do. Ambassador, this is a similar question. It's a little more general to you. You know, somebody who follows trade, you're ubiquitous. I see you talking to you know, some foreign partner. I see you talking to members of Congress. I see you giving speeches to, to groups. Um, in this environment where we've had a shift, apparently, at least in, the, in perhaps in the presidential election, m maybe this is all superficial, but it appears to be a shift in trade sentiment. What's, what's the top thing that you want to tell people when you have an opportunity? Just, just remember, when you're talking about trade, remember this or be aware of this. What's the number one thing that really I think people should bear in mind when they're hearing all this messaging, as the senator said, about trade being harmful? Well, look, I think... Uh the, the concerns that we're seeing out there about wage stagnation, about income inequality, uh, about the impact that, uh, that's been had on our, our workforce over the years, that's real. And, and I think that's underlying a lot of the political dynamic that we're seeing out there. And those are legitimate concerns. Uh, but I think, uh, to, to answer your question, we have to remind people of a couple things. First, we are making things in this country. We are actually producing more manufactured product in this country right now than we ever have in our history. Uh, now we're doing so with fewer workers, and that's largely because of automation. Uh, certainly globalization has had an impact on our economy, on wages, on income inequality. Uh, but globalization is the product of the containerization of shipping, uh, the spread of broadband, the integration of economies from Eastern Europe to China that used to be closed to the rest of the world and now part of it. It's a force. That genie's out of the bottle. You don't get to vote on automation. You don't get to vote on globalization. And so people look at trade agreements a bit as a scapegoat for other economic ills and for other for causes that you don't really get to control. Uh, the, my message to them is your concerns are legitimate, but what do we want to do about it? What can we do about it? And in our view, trade agreements is how you shape the global economy to make sure first that it's fair for American workers and farmers and ranchers and small businesses by tearing down barriers to other countries. Since we're already an open market, we face these barriers in other markets, we can level the playing field by tearing down those barriers. We drive more production to the United States, allow more good paying jobs to be based here and then export. And secondly, by raising standards in other countries. You know, uh, labor standards, environmental standards, intellectual property rights, uh, fair and open internet, uh, free and open uh, flows of data across border, all the things that are important to our companies. We want to make sure those are the rules of the road for the rest of the world so that we continue to prosper and, as the senator said, serve the 95% the of the, the customers that live, uh, that live outside the United States. So my main message is whether you love trade or hate trade, don't claim trade agreements for the effects of automation and globalization. Use trade agreements 
to shape the global economy so that it plays more to our interests and our values. Let me ask you a follow-up, which I think is a central question, but you can tell me, of course, that it's not. So let's, let's say someone accepts all that and they say, all right, fine, I understand that automation and globalization are, are, what's, are, 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 are bigger factors really than trade for the United States. But still, we're running, and we have, this is not a partisan thing, this has been true for decades. We're running a huge trade deficit. Doesn't that kill jobs? Doesn't that put downward pressure on wages? I mean, I accept your point about globalization and, and, and it's not being about our trade agreements, but doesn't the trade deficit say we're doing something wrong? So the trade deficit is, is a complicated issue because we know that exports are good, that they support good, well-paying jobs here in the United States. On the import side, it's a more mixed bag. As the senator said, a lot of imports that come into our country are inputs to products that, in fact, ultimately we may export again. In fact, 40% of what we import from Mexico is U.S. product, product that started in the U.S., went to Mexico for some processing, came back to the U.S., maybe put in a product that's exported uh, to Asia or to Europe or, or elsewhere uh, around the world. Um, obviously, imports also uh, affect consumers, and we know that over the years since the Second World War, the successive rounds of trade liberalization have added about $13,000 per American family in terms of purchasing power. Now, of course, some imports do supplant U.S. jobs here, and we have to make sure that uh, where that's happening, that at least the trade is, is fair, that uh, products aren't being dumped, that they're not being uh, unlawfully subsidized, that there is fairness in, in that relationship. You know, we had a wonderful trade surplus in the middle of the Great Depression. You know, uh, and we had a, a large and growing trade deficit in the 1990s when we were adding 20 million new jobs in the United States. So I think for those who say trade deficit is in and of itself a negative aren't necessarily looking at the linkages uh, that are there. Having said that, you know, we do want to see more exports from this country. We want to see more production in the United States. And we want to make sure that whatever imports do come into the United States are coming in on a fair basis. I have kind of an inside Washington question for you, Senator. And I, I know the ambassador may have a view on this, too. I'm going to start with you. Um, you know, even if you don't like TPP, Let's just say, I, I, don't, I don't like the agreement. There's an issue here of U.S. credibility. We've spent years negotiating it. Uh, we've negotiated in good faith. We passed trade promotion authority. Now we have an election or you know, something is going on in the Congress. And the executive branch and the, and the legislative branch can't agree. Now, we, we passed a TPA. That seems like we, we, the, the two sides were in lockstep, and, and yet now they're not. So what can we do, and you know, there's obviously two, two perspectives up on the stage on this, what can we do to, to just improve U.S. credibility, if not for TPP, for another trade agreement? This is a larger issue that TPP poses to us. If we negotiate it and then we can't pass it, we have problems with our partners. We did the right thing with TPA in terms of that credibility, and yet it doesn't seem to be paying off, or not yet. So how can the legislative and the executive work better on trade issues? Well, I Passing TPA was a good example of uh, that that cooperation and uh, and working together. But if, I, I agree that if we don't follow through and do this, uh, as I mentioned, countries have choices. Uh, multilateral trade agreements will be entered into. It's just whether or not we're a part of them. And if we're known as the country that can't get it together, if you start negotiations, they won't be finished. Then it, it's less likely that these countries that we want trade agreements with will enter into the discussions with us. And so it, it does uh, behoove us to move ahead and finish uh, this trade deal in particular, TPP. And it has broader implications than just uh, economic benefit for us. Uh, it has geopolitical and strategic uh, benefits as well. We want, in particular, the Southeast Asian countries to be part of our trade orbit and not just China's. And, and they have choices. And so I, I, do, I do think that it's important for us to, to show the world that uh, uh, we can complete these trade agreements, not just start them. And then and that's why talk by presidential candidates uh, about renegotiating or tearing up trade agreements is so devastating as well because uh, countries that want to enter into trade agreements might be reluctant if they think that that will be the ultimate outcome. 
Is there anything further that the Congress can do? And I, I don't know the answer to this question because I would have thought after the TPA vote the Congress did what it was supposed to do and maybe this is just out of control of the Congress. That happens sometimes, although maybe hard for members to believe. Um, but is there anything more that the Congress the administration, if not this administration, the next administration can do? Because again, everyone who cares about U.S. policy should care about credibility, whether they support TPP or not. The credibility is going to matter to all of our negotiations. Is there anything further we can do? Probably not in late September in an election year. <laughs> um, just, uh, uh, I think that's politically just probably asking too much uh, right now. Um, we're, uh, we've only got uh, a couple of legislative days left. We thought we might even finish this week. Looks like we'll be back next week to finish the continued resolution. But, uh, but beyond that, we're past the elections and to the lame duck before we're even back. Mm. So at this point, uh, I wouldn't expect more action. Thank you. Ambassador yes. from the executive branch side? Sure. I mean, as the senator said, we're, we're already <coughs> hearing from our partners in the region. Uh, Prime Minister Abe in New York this week, Prime Minister Lee when he was here uh, in August, uh, Prime Minister Key, uh, Prime Minister Turnbull, they've all made the point that our credibility is on the line and that uh, this is an economic issue, but it's also a strategic issue. You know, uh, Prime Minister Lee said, uh, you know, effectively, if we can't trust you to follow through when it comes to trade issues, how can we be sure you're going to be there when it comes to military and strategic commitments? And uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, this week was very articulate about uh, how apocal this uh, agreement is and how important it is uh, to move forward for the U.S.'s position in this region. You know, as we speak, China <coughs> is executing on its regional strategy. It's got the, the One Belt, One Road initiative, it's got the Silk Road Fund, it's got the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, uh, it's uh, got uh, what it's doing in, uh, with regard to maritime security, uh, and it's got the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, this trade agreement that the Senator referred to with 16 countries ranging from India to Japan. And if it moves forward and TPP doesn't, it means two things. One, we'll actually be excluded from some of the fastest growing and most important markets in the world. We'll see our market share go down as those markets are carved up by others. And secondly, the set of rules that will be put in place for trade in the region will be very different than they are with TPP. Unlike TPP, RCEP doesn't raise <coughs> labor and environmental standards. It doesn't uh, have strong enforcement of intellectual property rights. It doesn't put disciplines on government-owned corporations to make sure that they operate on a commercial basis. And it doesn't maintain an open and free internet. And that set of rules for this vitally important region or for the global economy more generally has got to be worse for American workers and farmers and ranchers and businesses than moving forward with TPP. And that's why there's so much at stake in getting this done. Let me try to push you off the TPP part of this in the sense of we're going to have other trade agreements. You've mentioned them. Uh, we're nego you're, you're, you're negotiating them right now. TPP has become, as we've seen in this room, uh, very controversial. But the credibility issue applies in Broader, the future absolutely. as well. Mm -hmm. So what, what happens in January? How does a new administration and a new Congress, they already have TPA, that's great. How, but how does a new administration and a new Congress avoid some of the clashes that have occurred over TPP so that we can present a, a, a better, uh, a, more, a more seamless front to, to trade partners and reassure them? Look, I think there's a great deal of uncertainty that if we don't move forward with TPP, that any trading partner is going to really take negotiations with us mm -hmm. seriously. I mean, if you, if you roll the, the, the calendar back, uh, it was very important for us to move forward and uh, get Korea, Colombia, and Panama done in order to create the credibility in the region to do TPP. How could you leave Korea undone and go to Asian partners and say, now we want to negotiate a new trade agreement mm -hmm. in the Asia Pacific? I think the same thing holds going forward. TPP doesn't move forward. It's not just about TPP. Mm -hmm. It's about our credibility going into any trade negotiation going forward. Uh, this is a, I'm going to follow po the political lead and get negative here. Um, sorry, but I have a small version of what, what you two have to deal with, with people bringing up very odd issues in opposition to trade. And I, I do want to give you both a chance to, you know, you've already talked about, look, there, there are real issues here. There are issues of automation. There's there are issues of people understanding supply chains, um, and maybe that's easier in a border state than it is in the interior of the country. Um, is the, are, there th are there real serious misconceptions out there 
just, just you know, not understandable clashes and people have different opinions, which we understand, but serious misconceptions out there about trade that, are, that are, have come to the fore uh, in, during the election season, maybe even been repeated by prominent candidates of one party or another, presidential, congressional, whatever, that, you, that you'd like to address. I, of course, have mine, um, but, but it's much more important to hear it from you two, e either one of you to, to start. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody jumped to I mean, that I question. Just, <laughs> I mean, uh, just the, the broader kind of America first kind of statement mm -hmm. that, that uh, implying that uh, we would be better off, not just on the trade front, but with regard to immigration, um, that, that we're better off building walls and uh, not trading uh, with, our, with our partners and, and simply going it alone. That uh, that somehow we'll be better off, and that I don't think that that uh, I mean that sentiment is is spoken certainly and uh, and out there. I think most people understand that that doesn't work, but it doesn't. Uh, it's still out there, and it's become more prominent that kind of feeling uh, in an election year, especially. Ambassador. Yeah, I think uh, uh, I'd point to uh, Congress asked the independent. International Trade Commission to do a report that looked backwards at all of our past free trade agreements and make an assessment about their impact on our economy. Uh, and they came out with a report a couple months ago, and the report showed, in fact, we have more jobs and higher wages in this country because of the trade agreements than without them. Now, there is, a, I think, a, a popular view of trade that trade kills jobs and hurts wages, but when you actually look at where we've got free trade agreements and what impact it's had, uh, the ITC has found uh, that it's been it's been positive, uh, you know. As, as the senator referred to, everybody knows of a factory down the road that closed down. Uh, but when you see jobs added at a factory because there's an extra shift because they've opened up five new markets, or you've seen <coughs> now finally a slight increase in wages because uh, we're we're able to to return to close to full employment and see more exports going abroad. Those are, it's hard to associate those with trade agreements the way that people associate the closing of a factory. And that, I think, looking at the macro picture and the impact that it's had on the economy as a whole has been, is very important. I think it is true that as a country, we haven't done as well uh, as we should have and as much as we should have to deal with the effects of dislocation, whether it's by automation, uh, whether it's by globalization, whatever the source. Um, as people are put out of a job uh, and communities are adversely affected by change, we haven't really had as, as much of an approach as, as I think we all would have liked to have seen. And that, I hope, is something coming out of this current debate that a future administration and a future Congress can work together to do more. You know, last year with TPA, Congress renewed the Trade Adjustment Assistance Act. Um, it was a good renewal, six years. It covered services, it covered not only people displaced by, uh, in, by competition with trade agreement countries, but by any international activity. But there's more to be done, whether it's lifelong learning or investment in infrastructure or skills building or other ways of helping communities that have been adversely affected by change. And that's, uh, that's something I think collectively we all need to focus on going forward. I think when, it, when it's tough to defend in a political environment uh, uh, the benefits of free trade, then. I think perhaps Republican candidates in, in the environment that we have now, at least, ought to be talking about uh, the need for better job training and, uh, and to prepare people, not just for trade agreements, but for the world as we know it, for globalization, whatever you want to call it. Um, but if we can refocus efforts and, and the debate, uh, then it would be to our benefit, I think. When you think about, you know, leaving aside trade completely, you think about <coughs> the impact that advanced manufacturing or artificial intelligence is likely to have on the workforce going forward, it's gonna have a very significant impact on jobs. And we need to be more prepared as a country for dealing with that kind of significant change. So, putting a little stamp on this, if the next administration and Congress can work together better on, on the U.S. labor market, that's gonna have a positive impact on the trade debate and help us move forward there. Uh, I would get wonkier and wonkier and all of you would fall asleep, uh, but rather than do that, let me open the floor to questions. Uh, I'm going to take an opportunity to advertise for AEI. We do not have institutional positions here. I can say one thing, my colleagues can say another. We may get dramatic evidence of that because I'm going to ask Claude Barfield to ask the first question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. 
Eric, I'm going to hit you on the TPP. <laughs> As Reagan said, you know, I'm not going to take advantage of my colleagues' youth and inexperience. <laughs> You'll mature and support the TPP at some point. Uh, my question actually is, it will, it will, I'll seem like I'm Derek, actually. Uh, it's to both of you, but a, a variation. Uh, you mentioned that there, we've had this raft of public opinion polls that look pretty good about Americans' feeling about trade. On the other hand, it does, I'm not sure it's really translating, and there's a question on the one side for the entrenched anti-trade elements in the Democratic Party and what seems to be now chaos on trade in the Republican Party. And the reason I raise this for the ambassador is that something that Sue Schwab at another meeting a couple of weeks ago pointed out, she said that in 2007 when they negotiated the so-called May 10th Agreement about labor and the environment, uh, one of the arguments to her was that this is the way that we will bring Democrats on board. And her point was, she said, I don't think in retrospect we picked up a single Democratic vote out of that. We've got somewhat the same situation with the TPP and the president. Uh, you all have touted correctly that this is the most progressive, uh, most environmentally progressive, the most labor uh, progressive uh, treaty uh, agreement that the United States has ever signed. And yet you don't seem to have had any impact on the party, and I'm talking about in Congress now. What's, what, why should we think that will be any different in a Clinton administration uh, if she wins? Uh, what's what's going to change it? You, it? It just seems too entrenched. On the Republican side, th th nothing seems to be entrenched in terms of trade <laughs> because there is, there is chaos. And I know, Senator, that you belong to a segment of the Republican Party that is more free market oriented and free trade oriented. But look, taking, taking your own prejudices and beliefs aside, where is the Democratic or the Republican Party going to be in 2017 and 2018? Is the Trump anti-trade view going to be counted as the Trump heresy, or will that become the orthodoxy for the Republican Party? And it comes down, actually, finally, the question, look, you served in the House. The House is the key here. It's been roughly true, it changes with different agreements, that you could count on two-thirds of Republicans voting for free trade agreements in the House and two-thirds of Democrats voting against. How will that change in your views, both of your views, or will it change? Uh, in 2017 and beyond, or even in the lame duck? That's a good way to shape the question. You know, we, we've had this trade pattern in voting, <laughs> and concretely, is that going to change? You know, are, are you bringing in Democrats with, with more progressive, in some senses, trade agreements? Is that going to change? Are we losing Republicans who are abandoning the traditional free trade position? Well, look, I think, uh, as, as you've noted, trade agreements the and trade It's nice that they're leaving so calmly. <laughs> but you know, it's, it, 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 I, I wish they would stay actually, because I, I think you know, what's interesting is if you took every one of those arguments, it's based on almost complete misinformation, and that's one of our challenges in the debate: is that the misinformation is out there. It, it's easy to criticize in one sentence, and it takes us three paragraphs to explain why it's wrong, and that's a bit of our challenge, I think, on the public debate. I think the Claude's question, the uh, uh, the. Trade laws and trade agreements have always gone through Congress, uh, as you said, largely with Republican support and then a critical mass of Democrats. Uh, and that was true with TPA last year. We had 41 Democrats between the House and the Senate voting for uh, uh, TPA, and the rest of the votes came from uh, Republicans. Um, you know, I don't, I, we're working to expand those numbers. Um, um, and I think uh, those numbers themselves are quite dependent on the fact that we've got May 10th plus strong labor and environmental provisions in there. We've taken other actions there that they view as important uh, to their uh, to, to their constituents, and so um, we've had. Uh, I think we, we've managed to build that critical mass of support among Democrats because we've taken this approach uh, uh, to trade. And I think the May 10th was a template that we have built on and gone beyond uh, in, 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 in TPP in, in important ways. Um, but I don't see that fundamentally changing in terms of over the long run, the support being largely uh, Republican and but always needing a critical mass of Democrats as well. And you know, we had more people vote for TPA 
um, last year than I believe, more Democrats voted for CPA last year than I believe voted for it in 2002, I think more than voted for CAFTA. And so yeah, we continue to build that support on the Democratic side of the aisle, but we're going to need, obviously, the support of uh, the core part of the Republican Party as well. To your question, uh, whether uh, the current position of a lot of Republicans and certainly our presidential candidate becomes uh, heresy or orthodoxy, uh, I think that all depends on the narrative that develops after the election. Uh, you know, if, if, if Hillary Clinton wins, then why did we lose? Was it because we didn't double down and go further on that? I, I hope, obviously, that, uh, that we have the appropriate uh, autopsy like we did last time and hope that this one lasts a little longer in terms of uh, the, <laughs> the remedies that, uh, that, we, <laughs> that we glean from it. Uh, but, uh, but I do think that it will depend on, uh, one, uh, you know, how the election comes up, uh, assuming as most are, it seems, in this room and across the country, that it uh, doesn't go Republicans' way. Uh, why it didn't, I, I think it would be hard to make the case. Um, but that's given my own biases that, uh, that it would be because we didn't double down hard enough on the, on the trade issue or, or push this America first kind of uh, rhetoric harder. But, uh, but it really depends on uh, groups outside of Congress and elected officials to uh, develop the narrative and quickly after the election um, if we want it to go our way. And, uh, and the way I think it should go. So it, it's an open question, but I hope it goes our way. So I would like to welcome critical questions uh, about free trade in general as someone who supports free trade about TPP. Um, so I don't, you know, just make sure you're asking a question rather than giving a speech. That would be wonderful. Um, in, in the back right there, right here, here. Thank you. Um, I have two questions for Michael Freeman. Uh, the first one is uh, TPP, you're dealing with uh, three of the top five export markets in the world, uh, with the US. And with bilateral treaty agreement, you're dealing with China. Do you have a priority within this year regarding these two agreements? And what do you think is most uh, challenging part in the Chinese negative list? And second question about uh, TPP. As, under, uh, as I understand, a lot of people in the US, they are not against uh, trade, but they think, uh, the treaty you are getting now is too soft on the American side. They want to get a better term in the specific uh, treaty agreement. So do you think it's a fair statement? So on the first question, the TPP is completed, it's been negotiated, it's been signed, and it's ready for congressional uh, action. And so that's certainly our priority vis-a-vis -vis Congress. As you know, we're also negotiating uh, a bilateral investment treaty with China, and there's uh, we are in uh, regular uh, rounds of negotiations and the Chinese side and, and, and in my view is taking the process uh, very seriously. Uh, we've made some progress, some significant progress, but we still have a ways to go before we can be satisfied that we've reached a high standard agreement uh, that addresses the particular concerns of investment uh, in China and that can ultimately get the approval of, of Congress, of the Senate. And so um, we're, we're going to keep on pushing to make sure we get a high standard agreement. It's not worth bringing home an agreement that is not high standard because it won't go anywhere. And so we've tried to convey that to our Chinese counterparts. I think on the, the, the substance of TPP, I have to say, I mean, the first, I'm sure it is not a perfect agreement. Um, no stakeholder got 100% of what they wanted in any uh, of, the, of the chapters. Um, but I am very pleased with the outcome from the perspective of the American economy. And I think that's uh, represented in the fact that not only do you have uh, 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 traditional supporters of you know, whether it's the Business Roundtable or the Chamber of Commerce or the National Association of Manufacturers or the American Farm Bureau, but we've been able to reach an agreement where we have both the textile industry for the first time to be fully in support of a trade agreement as well as the apparel importers. The footwear manufacturers of the U.S. as well as the footwear importers. The content industry of the United States, the, the movie companies, uh, 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 music uh, companies, things of that sort, as well as the internet companies. You know, these are constituents who are usually at odds with each other over policy. And when it comes to TPP, they are all supporting it. And so we have virtually the entire, 
business community across manufacturing, services, agriculture, the technology community, all in favor of it. And I think to me that really represents the fact that we, and our, 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 our negotiating team, really did a terrific job of, of working to pursue U.S. interests across the entire agreement. Senator, do you want to respond to the bill? Okay. Uh, directly back there, easy microphone reach. <laughs> I get. Uh, good morning. <clears throat> I'm Patrick Wilson from uh, Cummins, and uh, thanks, Ambassador and Senator, for coming today. Um, I, I wonder about whether we've entered a new period in politics where it's just not possible to have the, these negotiations in public. Uh, I don't mean to be uh, a, a naysayer, but I'm worried about our politics where as soon as you make a concession, you create an opportunity through funding, right, to fund a very aggressive campaign against whatever concession you make. And I'm wondering if it's the way we do negotiations itself that may have to change to adjust to this new reality or whether this is just typical. So is this an aberration or is this what the new normal will be? <laughs> well, look, I, I, think, uh, I think there are higher expectations of transparency now than ever before. And I think we need to find ways of being maximally transparent while actually being able to negotiate an agreement that uh, is the best possible agreement for American interests. Uh, we tried doing that uh, in TPP and introduced new concepts of, uh, for example, every negotiating round of TPP, we would suspend negotiations for half a day, invite stakeholders to come and present to not just us, but to the negotiators from all the countries. And some people would come and say they had one provision they wanted to talk about, and some people came and they were against the whole negotiation. And they all had equal time to present uh, to us and, and to make their, their views known. Uh, we, you know, Congress has created um, a, a series of, of advisory bodies uh, where we have everything from small businesses to farmers uh, to every major labor union uh, to a number of environmental groups and consumer groups and others. We count on them to give us input. And then very importantly, I mean, there's no area of policy where there's, correct me if I'm wrong, Senator, where there's more executive congressional collaboration, in my view, than trade policy. And we view our partnership with Congress as absolutely critical to make sure we're giving the people's representatives full transparency and input into the negotiations uh, so that we benefit from, from, from that process and make sure that the agreement that we're coming out with uh, reflects as much broad-based input as possible? That's a really good question. I, you know, as, as difficult as these negotiations are, if you're behind closed doors, it, it, even more difficult when you have to report out and, and respond to the various uh, you know, uh, you know, institutional requirements that we put on. But if Congress is going to uh, pass TPA and give the ability to the administration to negotiate, then politically, there needs to be, has to be, uh, these kind of transparency measures, at, at least. And I don't understand that's difficult. I mean, in Congress, I was involved when I first got to the Senate with the so-called Gang of Eight uh, uh, negotiations for on immigration reform. And for seven months, we met, uh, you know, virtually every night. And when we were here back in here in D.C. and and uh, those were closed negotiations. We'd obviously have to report out and go to, to other people, but, but we didn't have any requirements to, to report out what we were negotiating on. So it becomes increasingly difficult uh, um, with the speed of information that gets out. But I don't see a choice that, that we have if Congress is going to give up the ability to be in directly involved. Uh, Congress is going to require transparency as we go through the process. Man, right there in the middle. Thanks. Um, Kim Elliott with the Center for Global Development, and I wanted to ask a question um, to each. Um, to Ambassador Froman, I think, you know, the, the last um, intervener there the, uh, on the criticisms of the TPP, I mean, there are legitimate concerns about that U.S. intellectual property law is too strong, much less with that it's appropriate for a poor country like Vietnam. There are legitimate concerns about corporate abuse of the investor state dispute settlement in the regulatory area. Um, so, you know, what are the chances that in a future negotiation, U.S. trade negotiators would take those more seriously and, and maybe uh, reconsider those positions um, in order to gain more support 
um, for trade agreements from the broader public. And then to, to Senator Flake, there's been years and years and years of talking about how we need to do more for dislocated workers on training and, and other parts of the safety net. And you know, I remember, I think it was perhaps the 2002 Trade Promotion Authority debate where um, Representative, then Representative Barney Frank said, well, you know, why shouldn't we hold these trade agreements hostages until we actually see something happening to help dislocated workers? So, you know, what do you say to those people? We talk and talk and talk about doing more for dislocated workers, but that part of the redistribution doesn't happen. So, you know, how do you respond to those? You say, well, may, you know, maybe we shouldn't keep approving trade agreements until we actually do something. Critical questions. Great question. <laughs> so, first of all, I think we do take those concerns seriously, and I think we took them seriously in, in TPP. Uh, if you take investor state dispute settlement, which I think is one of the major areas of controversy around, around trade, we share a lot of the concerns that people have raised about investor state dispute settlement. We want to make sure it's used for the appropriate purpose, which is why we've added procedural and substantive safeguards. We've made them fully transparent. We've raised the standard to make sure that, for example, the the, the investor has to prove all, has to bear the burden of proof of all the elements of their claim. They can't bring a claim for lost profits. They can't bring a claim because a government has uh, changed the regulation, because we say the governments have the right to regulate. Um, that, uh, uh, that if they can't establish all the elements of the claim, then they can't bring it forward. They can't forum shop between domestic courts and international arbitration. Once they choose to go down the route of international arbitration, they give up their rights in U.S. courts. And so we've, t over the years, and TPP has gone further than ever before, we've raised the standard, added safeguards, and closed loopholes that we've seen emerged around the world. And as you know, I mean, we, we have, there are 3,200 agreements in the world that have investor state dispute settlement. We're party to 51 of them. We've had them for more than 30 years. We've had a total of 18 cases filed against us in 30 years. 13 cases have gone to conclusion, and we've never lost a case. And that's because our approach to ISDS is based on the Constitution and the Fifth Amendment and the Takings Clause. Mm -hmm. And because our regulators and our government have to operate under the Constitution, we feel we're in pretty strong ground to defend ourselves against any challenge on, on expropriation. Because if there's going to be expropriation, they're going to have been challenged in domestic courts as well, which they, always, which they often are. Um, our goal is to make sure that Americans doing business abroad have some modicum of the kind of protections that we provide Americans and foreigners in the United States under the Constitution. And that's what our approach to ISDS has been. I could talk about IPR as well. You know, on IPR, our, our goal, we have 40 million Americans whose jobs are tied to IPR. It's one of our, we are a knowledge economy. We think it is important to protect IPR, but also to make sure that there's access to the benefits of innovation, including in the pharmaceutical area. And you know, the one major outstanding issue that we have right now with, with Congress, uh, with uh, Chairman Hatch and others, uh, is the thought that we didn't go far enough on IPR uh, protection because we didn't get close enough to U.S. law. Um, now, it's not USTR's position to rewrite U.S. law. We take our guidance from Congress, and that's where the debates about where to strike balances between different values in our, in our society are to be worked out. Once Congress decides, our, goal, our role is to take those positions and to work with them to see what we can do internationally as well. Uh, we tried to make sure in our trade agreements that we can both promote innovation and uh, the access to it. One thing I find is interesting, because you refer to Vietnam, you know, these de <laughs> the, the developing countries sometimes get this issue more than our own NGOs do, because they want to be innovative economies. They want to attract investment in innovation industries, and they know that having a decent intellectual property rights regime you know, with decent enforcement is important to do that, and that's one reason why TPP was so important because it was both developing, emerging economies, and advanced industrialized economies all agreeing on what an appropriate innovation ecosystem looks like uh, for, the, for the region. With regard to trade adjustment assistance, I think you're referring to more broadly. I, you know, I vote for trade adjustment assistance as a price you pay to get the trade agreement. Um, I have little faith that, uh, that those that you can specifically say, all right, uh, we've entered into this trade agreement which will make this factory perhaps uh, not competitive or whatever. I, federal government's never been very good at specifically going in and, and, and training for particular jobs that are being lost. I, I, so I, I would favor decoupling, uh, to the extent we can, uh, job training programs from specific trade agreements, simply because we just don't plan very well at the, 
federal level. But I, I understand the broader point that you make, and uh, but I think it's a bigger question about uh, you know automation and globalization that that uh, trade agreements are the best response to what is already going on, and so I I, I don't know that uh, that we could ever say all right let's move forward with a trade agreement when we see sufficient investment in job training specific to that trade agreement. Uh, I just don't know how that would work, but it's a good good question. Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. I apologize. I am completely picking people at random, and we have busy people up on the stage who need to get someplace over here. Why is it that the protesters don't need a mic at all? <laughs> <laughs> but those who ask questions, so, I mean, you can hear them just fine. <laughs> Good question. Um, hi, I'm Jenny Leonard with Inside US Trade. I have a question for the ambassador. Um, on the timing, so have you sent any language to the committees of jurisdiction to do a walkthrough of the bill? Or if you haven't, how are we on timing? How do, do you have enough time in the lame duck to get through all the procedural steps here? So we're in, uh, in constant dialogue with our trade committees, uh, finance and ways and means, as well as leadership about the best way uh, to move forward, as you uh, I'm sure know, because I'm sure you reported on it. Uh, we sent up the draft uh, statement of administrative action and the final text of the agreement uh, uh, last month, um, consistent with the procedures established under TPA last year. And we're continuing to work with our uh, uh, committees uh, uh, in Congress to determine what the best way forward is for the next stage. I have a follow-up question for the Senator, and we're almost out of time, but I think this is really useful for you to say. The lame duck is not just about, I take up TPP, I don't take up TPP. There are a lot of competing issues. Can you talk about you know, what the level of, how crowded it's going to be? I mean, there's the willingness, and there's also the capacity if other things, and I, you, know, you know much better than I what might come up, but if you could say a few words about, wow, the lame duck session looks really crowded, or no, I think we have the space to take up the things we want to take up. Well, for me, this would be at the top of the list. <laughs> uh, it really will. I'm not sure that, uh, that others feel the same way. And just dealing with uh, the, the CR, the continuing resolution we're going to pass, it's not likely to go into next year. It'll likely go just to the first uh, week of um, December. And so just dealing with funding the government mm -hmm. is going to be top priority for, uh, um, for most of my colleagues. But I, I'd like to put this at the top of the list, really. All right, uh, we have two gentlemen who have many other things to do, so I'd uh, like you to join me in thanking them for their time and their responses here. That's great, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. If you could, wherever they're going out, if you could not please get in the way, and thank you for coming to AI. <laughs>